Welcome to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. I'm Sean Finder, and I'm with my host, Ollie Whitfield. This show is brought to you by AutoClose, a vanilla soft company. Ollie, why don't you introduce today's special guest and what we're going to be talking about today? It's always a good day in vanilla soft and AutoClose land if you talk to Dan Sims. So that's all I'm going to say about him. His ego is big enough, his head big enough. I need no further introduction, but <laughs> in case you don't know him, he is the head the director of our customer success team. So if you've ever worked with us, you probably met him. And uh, for that, I apologize. But he has done an extensive, and when I mean extensive, I'll elaborate, extensive amount of research into the future of particularly SMS, if you are sending SMS to anybody, prospects, that type of thing, and cold calling and cold email. Now, we did a webinar about this, and um, we like went a little bit over time. So uh, this is sort of a 15 to 20 minute podcast. This is my job for today is to get these two guys to deliver this in like a 15th of the time somehow. Wish me luck. But um, I want to go to Dan first. So welcome to the podcast, dude. I know that you listen occasionally. Is this a dream come true or like uh, you've been dragged in by marketing? Oh, man, I, I was hoping and praying and wishing I could make it here. But I'm way closer to the zero than to the five million. Uh, and so I, I never thought this day would come. But yeah, I finally made it. Hi, mom. Uh, long time listener, first time guest. Fair play. Hi, mom. Well, you should have had that on the t-shirt. I think that would yeah. have been yeah, maybe for the like the next one. We'll do that. I'll get you that shirt sent over. Next one? Oh, man. Don't tease me. So um, let's start off. I'm going to do yeah. the two channels with you just as we did in the webinar. And of course, if you are listening, there may or may not be a link to that below if you'd like to watch that too in greater detail. But we'll do SMS and phone with you first. What's the state of play? What's on the horizon? What's changing? What's coming? And then we'll come to Sean about email as we did. And then uh, I'm sure we can all have some fun at the end if there's time. But um, SMS or phone, what do you want to go to first? I'll start with SMS uh, and I'll try and be as succinct as possible. So uh SMS, it is basically going through regulation right now. And that regulation is kind of bucketed under what's called 10 DLC. 10 DLC stands for 10 digit long code. So the, the TLDR of this is that there's short code SMS, which is like text one, two, three, four, five to get a free Big Mac or whatever. Um, and those are also the texts you get blasted from, right? There's a ton of rules, a ton of regulation around those numbers. They're very finite. There's not a lot of five digit numbers you can generate uh, in, you know, across the country. Uh, and so they're, they're very regulated. The type of traffic that's sent through them is regulated. How much you send, who you send to, all of that, highly regulated. Then you had this big gap. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you had cell phones, you know, full actual 10 digit numbers. No regulation. You could do whatever you wanted. Well, this 10 DLC process, which is regulating A to P traffic, a lot of acronyms. A to P stands for application to peer, which is a differential from peer to peer, cell phone to cell phone. That traffic, which is any VoIP, any software, anything that is not your actual cell phone device that sends a text counts as A to P application to peer traffic. And if it's A to P traffic, it falls under 10 DLC and the regulations. The frustrating part, I keep saying regulation, and that conjures images of kind of government regulation. That's not the case here. This is the big carriers have banded together. Verizon's finally limped along and got in there. But for the past several years, it's really just been AT&T and, and T-Mobile who have kind of come up with rules to follow if you want to be sending business texts, right? If, whether it's to other businesses, to consumers, to whoever. But if you want to send them for the purpose of business, A to P style, you have to go through these these hoops. Um, we're a little bit bearish on it right now because the goalposts keep changing and that regulation is not settled. So unlike when the government does something, it wasn't like, here are the rules you're going to follow. And as long as you stay within these lines, you're going to be okay. That's not been what happened. And, and you can go to any, uh, we did this, you go to any trade show, any conference, talk to any marketer, anyone who's gone through this, anyone who does SMS, if you just say 10 DLC and whisper that in their ear, they're going to get some PTSD. They're going to start rocking back and forth in the fetal position because it's been a headache. Um, and all it's really done is slowed things down. It's gotten in the way. And even when you're coloring between the lines, even when you're playing by the rules, driving the speed limit, you still can be impacted. So we've seen whole industries get wiped out because, for example, debt consolidation, credit repair, one of the carriers, not all of them, but one of them decided, yeah, we don't want that traffic on our network. And so now you just 
can't send those that sort of content to that one carrier's network. Uh, even if you're registered and in good standing with 10 DLC, another carrier says if you have more than 49 numbers, you have to pay us $2,000 for us to approve the 50th number and beyond. Uh, and that's a vetting process that takes anywhere from one week, which I've never seen, to four months, which I have seen. So it, there's just all these artificial delays and blockers and speed bumps and roadblocks in the way of SMS right now. And the rules are shifting day to day. The latest thing, uh, in the little form you fill out to submit, you have to give your company website. The newest thing is now, well, if that company website has a form on it, and if that form has a field for a phone number, they assume you're going to text that phone number. And so you have to then capture consent to say, hey, by filling this form out and checking this box, you agree that we're going to send you SMS messages on this phone number, even if that's not what you do. Uh, and there's a lot of companies that, uh, and we're one of them, where we ask for phone numbers, but we don't text prospects. We we call them uh, and email and follow up through other channels initially. So there's a lot of rules that are shifting. It's very unclear. A lot of businesses are getting impacted. The cost keeps going up to do this, but there's no real light at the end of any tunnel. Um, and a lot of practices, you know, people will say, oh, just spread your text messages across multiple numbers. So no single number sends too much. That is a process they call um, snowshoeing, and they will ban you for that. So then you say, well, what if we just have a single number and we send it out? Well, then you might be at risk for exceeding their daily volume thresholds, which, by the way, are different from each carrier. Some carriers have a per minute, like you can send X messages per minute. Others say you can send up to 2,000 in a day. There's just no consistency. There's a million ways to get blocked and no clear way to get your message delivered. So it's kind of luck of the draw. It's sort of like driving five mi miles over the speed limit on the highway where you're probably not going to be pulled over, but you could be at any time. And if you get pulled over, there's not a lot you can do. We see people getting penalized who are following the same process as their colleague sitting next to them, but they just happen to be uh, uh, on the back foot on that one. So that's kind of what we see from SMS. It is still on the move. It is yet to settle. Hopefully it will soon. And look, once it's regulated, once we understand the rules, great, we can play by the rules. No one seems to be clear on what exactly those rules are. So there's no letter you can follow. You kind of just have to take your best guess on what to do. So coincidence or not, you tell me, Dan, I've received a lot less crypto scam texts from Sean. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that is a direct, uh, cause Sean's still sending them. Believe me, he's still trying. All right. Those messages are still trying to go right. out, but they're getting blocked. He's, they're getting he's, blocked he's probably going to move on to like Facebook messenger or something like that. I'm sure. At yeah. Some point. Maybe drift into WhatsApp or something. Yeah. Or we That's can try next. some other okay. channels. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> like telegram groups and all that sort of stuff. I can see it playing out now. So yeah. maybe uh, fax know, before, machines make a comeback. Before we jump into call, I mean, I know we talked about this. We've talked about this offline as well. Like do either of you actually ever reply to cold text messages that are trying to sell you something like for me it just it just says spam fraud right away i'm not click i'm even i'm even hesitant to click when actually like a, my actual bank sends me something ask yep. me to click i'm always hesitant to click because i still don't think it's for me or i don't do you think guys exactly do this real. as well when you get them you know sometimes it says uh, reply the word stop in capital letters to cease communications i even think like oh i don't know is is that is that how they're going to do that, me or not? Like, I, is that I just giving don't my bank it. account information to these guys? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's questionable. I mean, and technically, replying stop should opt you out, but there's not a ton stopping someone from seeing that reply of stop and going, oh, this is an active number. They are alive there. You know, there's there's bad actors out there. And the, what we've seen is that this, this 10 DLC regulation has done not enough to really combat the bad actors. But the good actors, it's put a lot of things in their way. So hopefully it turns around. Hopefully it, it starts to add up and make sense to where businesses who are who want to operate and you know are willing to pay more, are willing to do what it takes and, and be regulated, as long as we know what rules to follow, we'll follow them. We're, we're not there yet where you can do that and, and expect to, to be successful on the other side. That's sort of what we're waiting for right now. They seem to kind of be you know, firing from the hip on this and just trying different things without a lot of forethought into what it might mean or what the consequences are. We're still, we've been waiting now for, uh, I think like two and a half years to, wow. to wait for this dust to fully settle because it's been delayed. Rollouts have had issues, but it's, it's still very unclear. The water's extremely muddy, unlike voice. So let's hear about the, 
Voice. What do you think? Where do you think we're going with voice? Voice is a little different. Um, so voice has had a problem, much like SMS, with spam. Um, and anyone in North America has felt this. You've, If you're watching this, listening to this, you've likely been robocalled. Um, and that's really been the big bane of, uh, of phone carriers and telcos. Can we existence quickly lately. define that, Dan? So robocalling, by my definition, let's see if we match up here, is when you pick up and you say hello, and you wait a couple of seconds, and then it's like someone comes off of mute and you hear quite often background noise, and then you hear something like, hello, is this Dan? I heard you recently had a car crash because you're a bad driver. So on, right? Is yep. it that type of thing or different? <laughs> Uh, that is, that is one of them. And that classifies and it, it all depends under like under TCPA. Yeah. That counts as auto dialing and auto, you know, it's, it's not a human telling you to call a number. And so, yeah, it gets classified as that. The other case of robocalling calling is where you answer the phone and it's a pre-recorded message saying you have won a cruise or yeah. whatever nonsense it is. So I had a tax problem on once. I, I owe a million pounds. I haven't yeah, earned a million I, pounds, but yeah, cool. I mean, I, I live in Canada and I owe millions to the IRS somehow. So um, yeah, it's it's bad all over. So that's been a problem. We've all had it. Uh, car warranty calls were, were really popular for a while there. That one though is also being regulated. It's still, the, the regulation's there. We know what it looks like. It's being implemented across all the telcos still. Uh, we're at like 90 plus percent there. So almost there. But this one is mandated by the government. It came from the FCC. It's been slow as molasses kind of as a result, but we're finally at that inflection point where it's being implemented. It's being rolled out. And the whole idea behind it is this. If we look at telephony and phone, right? It's copper wires, right? 50 years ago, that's what it was. Copper wires going back and forth, very limited data other than the voice transmission that's there. Um, fast forward now, we've got smartphones, we've got the internet, we have APIs and all of this, but telephony technology hasn't really changed. And really all you can do when you make a call and broadcast is this is the number that's calling and this is the number I'm calling into. So the problem with that is if you're, let's say AT&T, any carrier, but let's say it's AT and T. If you get a call through, even from a from a cell phone that's outside your network, you don't know where that call's coming from. You see the number on the caller ID, but you don't know if that's real because caller ID, if you didn't know, is easy to spoof. And I'm sure we've all been on the receiving end of that yeah. too, where you get a call from a number that looks suspiciously like your cell phone, or you get a call from a number and you call it back. And, you know, it's Domino's Pizza or something. And they're going, why are you calling us? Or, you know, it's a, it's a neighbor down the road. And they're going, I never called you. It's because someone else called you but spoofed their number. And carriers can't tell the difference. Well, there's a new framework called Stir Shaken. It's not a James Bond thing. It's just a clever name. It's called Stir Shaken. If you Google it, you'll get a lot more info. And basically what that's doing is it's doing a handshake anytime a call is, is made and received. So I place a call to Sean, my carrier is making an API call to the FCC's database. Sean's carrier makes a, a similar call to the database. My carrier is saying, hey, we verify this call is coming from our server. We know the number. It's our user. Sean's carrier is then going there and saying, okay, we see this code. Is it valid? Is it in good standing? And that's basically all it is. And if, that, if it is, great. Let the call go through. If it's not, that's where there could potentially be consequences like flagging the call as spam or blocking the call entirely. What does that all mean? It means now the biggest culprit of robo-dialing in the US is honestly international bad actors calling in or these rogue operations that are kind of relaying through these different points. You can't tell the source. It's hard to track down where it is. But now because of the stir shaken, the receiving carrier can make that API call to the FCC. And if they see, hey, there's no handshake here. There's no token. There's no there's no secure key that tells me this is a valid call. Well, now I can make an informed decision and say, I actually am not going to take the call. So it's reducing already and will continue to reduce the volume of robocalls you actually get because the carriers are going to start being able to filter those out more and more with more and more accuracy because they'll know what to trust and they'll know what is dubious at best. And again, because the, the rollout's only at about 90%, Carriers can't yet just fully block calls that don't have that token because not every carrier, even legitimate ones, not everyone's adopted it just yet. Once it at 100%, though, then we can start seeing it. But there's a secondary benefit, which is that because of this whole registration, because of stir shaken, the FCC now knows where these calls are coming from, right? Because this, this handshake is going on. So if there's no handshake, great, we can reject the call. 
let's say there is a handshake, you can still violate, right? People can still robocall, but there can be consequences now. So at the start of this year, Twilio, and I think we've all heard Twilio, we all know Twilio, Twilio got a public, and there's a press release about it if you Google it, Twilio got a cease and desist from the FCC. And the FCC, I forget if it was seven days or something, but they gave a pretty short timeline. They're like, look, you have to, you, one of your customers, one of their customers, and they have a few customers, one of your customers is making illegal calls to people who don't want calls. We are going to shut you down, Twilio. We're going to tell every other carrier in the United States to not allow your traffic through unless you remediate this in the next X days. Huge flex. The FCC has never really been able to do that. They've never really been able to hold people accountable and say, hey, it's your network, it's your traffic, it's one of your users who are making these illegal calls with that level of confidence and accuracy. So for them to make that move was huge. And what it turned out is Twilio had one client who had a client under them who was doing this. And so they Twilio shut down that client. And anyway, it caused all these ripples kind of unheard of before where an entire company you know, who, who sells VoIP solutions. One day they log in, all their users log in. They just don't have phone service, right? They're just completely shut off by Twilio because of the FCC. So heavy handed, I don't know, maybe, but it shows that the FCC can throw their weight around. It shows that there are consequences now for these actions. So even the pseudo legitimate auto dialing, predictive dialing, robo dialing that comes out of the US, there can now be consequences if you're violating the law. If you're breaking TCPA law, the FCC can bring the hammer down on you and there can be meaningful consequences. Because of that, and we already see it, there's a reduction in overall robo calls in these predictive dials, in these automated calls that come into the US. There's been a reduction and that's going to get reduced further as this continues to be rolled out. And as the number of calls, like right now, you know, you get 20 calls in a day, 19 of them are going to be spam calls and fake calls or scam calls. If it suddenly changes to where now you're getting three calls a day, and maybe one of them is a spam call, but the, the rest are legit, or maybe all of them are legit, consumers, your target audience, they're going to answer the phone more. People don't want to answer right now from a number they don't know already, because nine times out of 10, that's what it is. It's a scam call. It's a it's a robo call. But as that stops being a problem, we anticipate pickup rates are going to increase because the channel is less noisy. You know, yeah. you, you can relate it to email, right? You get tons and tons of email, which means email is a very cost effective channel. But you know, the chances of getting a, a single email read is low. Open rate expectations tend to be pretty low and, and lower than connect rate. But if you only got three emails, like I'm old enough to remember back in the '90s when email was new. You know, you've got mail, you'd log in, you'd freak out. Oh my God, I got mail. That's maybe where we're going to be heading towards again with phone, where there's going to be less noise, less of this spammy noise coming into your phone all the time, making it ring off the hook. Uh, it's going to be more direct, more fair and uh, above board. That is good. I'm pleased about that. I think a lot of the problem with the phone beyond people using it poorly is the trust. That is literally yeah. the only problem that prohibits any performance increase possible. You can do whatever tactic you'd like, but just the general perception of cold caller equals bad hinders everyone. So I think if that goes any way towards removing that, that's excellent. But uh, but guys, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I'm kind of clock watching. I know we've got to get out, out of here in a minute and I need to come to Sean to grill him about emails and uncover all the things he doesn't know. But Dan, is there any other stuff for, for fine that we need to go to? I think we hit the main ones. Let's go to Sean. You nailed it. So, Mr. Finder, email, what's the state of play? So, so I mean, I think, you know, everyone is hearing the whole AI word around and chat GPT, et cetera. Those are the big key words that everyone's talking about right now. And I think- you know, I'm surprised you don't have a course on that yet or something like that. You are that sort of, you know- it, It's coming. It's coming. Ethereum book, is, right? is big, you know, all that. But um, I think it, it'll play a part. Um, but I think there's also going to be softwares out there to track these chat GPT messages. So hmm. I, I don't think – I think people will be using them. People will be automating a lot of stuff uh, coming along. But I do think there will be some sort of compliance with – obviously with everyone just sending automated messages. Just like I'm finding out now with all these school essays of people are writing – they're having their essays done to so giving it to their teachers. And there's actually now software saying, okay, well, that's there and they're failing people. So – I think that will become bigger. I've been saying for years video um, and every year it gets a little bit bigger, but it's still, I don't think hit that, 
that stage where it should be um, because I still don't get too many videos in my email on a daily basis. So it's not too crowded. Um, personalization, I think that will only get stronger. I think um, anyone that's not personalizing um, will be left behind uh, because people now are too smart to realize that you're using some sort of automation tool that is not personalized. Um, and lastly, I would say compliance. I think, you know, we do have can spam, we do have Castle, we do have GDPR. Um, I think now with all these different automations and chat GBT and everything, I think compliance will come back into play again. I think there's going to be a few slaps on the wrists. Um, I think Google, Microsoft, all these players are going to get smarter um, and try and block that stuff. But um, I do think it's interesting times, I would say the next three to five years of email. Um, but as I've, as I've mentioned many times, Ollie, on, on our podcast is you can't rely on one channel. I, and I always like to say, you know, email is one of three. Um, preferably for me, I always like email voice and I always like LinkedIn because you can do a lot of intangible touches. I'm not a big SMS guy personally um, because I personally don't reply to them when I don't know the person. Um, but I would say those are the three channels. But I would say you're going to see a lot of changes just with all this new innovation technology coming out um, over the next three to five years. So um, that's what I will say on the email part. And all if you have anything to add, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. So when you started off with um, ChatGPT, obviously that's the big one at the moment. There's obviously going to be variations of it made by other people. So to use that meaning all of them. Yeah. Um, I can see it's really interesting how quickly essays were um, it, oh, the yeah. software that you talked about, how people have built that and found it. So you can't just chat GPT your college assignment away. What I'd really like to get to, and it would be super interesting when it gets better and they're more sophisticated and clever, is if I could say, like, I'm Ollie and I sell A, B, and C to X, Y, and Z people. I'm now looking at this prospect, Sean. Here's this person. Here's his profile. Here's the latest um, financial reports from his company or whatever else, right? find the best way to pitch my stuff to him in a way that would resonate. Like it'll do the dots quicker than you ever could and yeah. better at some point. It probably already could. It's probably really slow manual to do that. But that, at that point, that's like unfathomable at some point. You know, like even I've, I've, I remember when chat GPT came out, I was like gobsmacked by it. I've no, I'd never heard that this was even a thing. And then all of a sudden one day it just came out of nowhere to, to me and a lot of people. So that will be awesome. Really interesting to see where that goes. Yeah, and, and, and personally, I, I don't know if you, if you guys, I mean, once I talk to somebody a lot, I know how they should sound in their emails. So I think yeah. one thing I, you know is going to be is if you're sending those emails that are automated through ChatGPT or any of the other ones, and then you actually get on the call and your vocabulary, your words, your, your, what you're using are totally different. For me, it won't be as authentic. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens, but I still think – you know, we're very at the early stages, um, but it's uh, a lot of exciting times around the email channel um, and the voice channel, I think, uh, coming in the next three to five years. If it can ever make spelling mistakes like you, it's, I'm out of here. You know, it, it, it was weird. Now that I'm talking about, I, I have to make sure that your resume was not automated and, and wrote by them. I'm going to have to validate all those previous experiences on your resume, Ollie, just to make sure uh, everything is legit there. Could you tell me what a podcast is? I've been meaning to ask you this whole time. <laughs> Sean, just run it through ChatGPT. It'll tell you what's legit. <laughs> exactly. Did you make this? Question mark. <laughs> exactly. I, well, you know what? Before we end the show, we do ask our audience, and I'd love to ask you, Dan, how do you currently self-educate yourself? Because uh, you are a wealth of knowledge. Is it a lot of podcasts you're listening to, reading books, just LinkedIn? How are you kind of um, educating yourself? I mean, it's mostly this podcast. Most of my knowledge comes from the Zero to Five Million podcast. I tune in every week, uh, as everyone should. But uh, outside of this, I subscribe to a bunch of uh, newsletters, like daily newsletters and weekly newsletters that are kind of founder focused or tech focused. Um, you know, I use Owler as Owler to get uh, notifications on other big industries and what they're doing. And yeah, I love LinkedIn. Uh, I like books, and uh, every now and then I'll dip into another podcast. But it always feels like cheating to me, so I, I try not to. Um, but very occasionally I'll, I'll, I'll dip into something else. Perfect. And where can, uh, I guess just where can people get in touch with you if they have any questions about phone SMS, probably LinkedIn, but maybe get your email as well. 
LinkedIn's good. Daniel at VanillaSoft.com is my email. But if you really want to learn, just go straight to VanillaSoft.com. Hit that Get a Demo button, and uh, one of our sales experts will be able to, to walk you through it and, and talk to you about how this all works and how it comes together and what we might be able to do to help. Perfect. Well, I want to thank Dan for joining us today and everybody that was listening. This has been a, a great episode and a little bit of a different episode. Um, if you enjoyed the show today, don't forget to give us a five-star review wherever you're listening from and subscribe so you don't miss the next show. See you soon.